Good morning. There's a voice. It's more than mine. It's a little bit amplified. I had planned on talking about the reminders that we see in this Christmas season. All the wonderful reminders of Jesus and of God's plan to redeem mankind. Things like Christmas trees. We bring these trees into our homes because they are evergreens. And the evergreen idea reminds us of eternal life that God has given us through His Son. We see holly, and sometimes we decorate with holly. And holly reminds us of the crown of thorns that Jesus wore. And the red berries on the holly remind us of the blood that He shed. So many things like that. Just a simple candy cane, for example, Looks like a shepherd's crook, and of course the shepherds were the ones to whom the angels went to announce the birth of Jesus and to say, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. And you turn that shepherd's crook upside down and it's a J. It represents Jesus. And everybody knows that when you picture a candy cane in your head, it's, it's probably what two colors? Red and white. Red, of course, for the blood of Jesus, and white for the purity that that blood brings to our souls. Those are the kind of reminders I wanted to talk about this morning. But it turns out that real life has given us a reminder that we never would have chosen. When on Friday, 20 little children were senselessly and ruthlessly murdered. And there's no way in the world that anything a preacher could say or anybody could say, there's no set of words that anybody could put together that would make that situation right. The only... One who could make that right is Jesus. And he's been working to make it right ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. It wasn't just this, this shooting at the school in Connecticut. You know, we had another shooting in Oregon last week. A guy goes into a mall and starts shooting. And I've, I've wondered, and I've probably spoken to some of you, I wondered when it's going to be. Somebody finally gets the idea, hey, I'll go to a mall and I'll shoot people. There'll be a bunch of people I can shoot at a mall. And what usually winds up after the shooting's done? Shooter takes his own life. How desperate, how horrible, how depraved must someone's life be that that's how they want to end it. They want to kill other people and then kill themselves. What kind of a world do we live in? I'll tell you the kind of a world we live in. We live in a world that's no different today than it was 6,000 years ago when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. It's the same place, the same stuff's going on. Thankfully, in this country, God has shielded us to a great extent from a lot of the harm that goes on in the world. But all you have to do is open up your internet or pick up several different kinds of magazines. And we can read about horrific things that are going on all over the world today. We read about this event in history. Matthew chapter 2, about how Herod was so power mad, so power hungry, that if there's a king born somewhere, he's going to put that king to death. And so he goes, because the, the wise men didn't come, they weren't there like we see the manger scenes when Jesus was there as a little baby. They saw the star in the east, and they started their journey. And it took them a while to get there. And by the time they got there, Jesus wasn't in the manger anymore, I'm sure. And then when they told Herod about it, and Herod said, well, when you find him, you, you come back and you tell me because I want to go worship him. Yeah, right. So by the time Herod figured out that the Magi weren't coming back, did you notice how old the children were that he decided to kill? Two years old. Every child two years old and under was put to death. Can you imagine? One day you're just going about life. Next thing you know, the king's men are there. And I know if you've thought about this either, Herod is the one who commissioned that to be done, but somebody had to carry it out. Somebody had to say, all right, I'm a servant of the king, so I'm going to go and I'm going to kill babies. I wish that were a thought that had never been conceived by man. But then you think about it again, statistically every day, in this country alone, and I'm not trying to make this a political statement, I'm trying to make it a moral statement. Statistically, 2,000 babies will die every day in this country because of abortion. It's 
Starts out sounding really bad, doesn't it? And yet, have you noticed the good that's in the world? If you're upset about what happened Friday, thank God. What would it be like if we weren't upset? How depraved would the world be if we did not hurt over what happened in Connecticut, what happened in Oregon, and what's happening in the Congo and other places in this world where horrific deeds are being done? Across the country and across the world, people have poured out their sorrow over this deed. It won't be the last one. If the Lord waits, there'll be more things like this to happen to us. All you have to do is say 9-11, and what kind of images does that conjure in the mind? And before 9-11, it was Pearl Harbor. We've even forgotten about names like Benoit, Quezon, places where things happened that were horrible, and war. Gettysburg, we remember Gettysburg probably because we've seen the movie. Oh, that's a neat movie, but you recall that nearly 50,000 men were casualties in that three-day battle in that horrific war. This world is a mess, and there is one hope, there is one answer, and only one. And we are here today because we believe that very fact that Jesus is the only hope we've got. As a matter of fact, when you think about it, and here's a question. I'll, I'll put this question to you just, just for thought because I don't even know the right answer to it. If you could go to Connecticut right now and you could go to the bodies of those little children that were murdered last Friday, if you could put your hand on each one of those and bring them back to life and restore them to their parents, would you do it? It's not a trick question, but it's one that provokes a little deeper thought than might be on the surface. Where are those children right now? If you're as confident as I am, where do you think they are? They're with the Lord. There's no better place to be in the universe than with God, and they are with God. And I believe there's not a single thing between them and the Lord that would keep them from being with Him for all eternity. And yet our hearts go out to their families and the loss that they've sustained, thinking about what it must have been like. We read about Bethlehem and those little children dying there. And we, we might try to go back in our mind and put ourselves in that situation and imagine what it must have been like and, and what we might have done to help comfort those parents. But it's impressed on me when I read this. Verse 18. I don't know if you caught this or not. Verse 17 says, Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. And here's the quote from Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused, she refused to be comforted. Why would she refuse to be comforted? Well, you, it doesn't take a whole lot of thinking to figure out why she would refuse to be comforted. There's value in the grief process. There's so much emotional energy bound up in facing that kind of loss that you've got to get it out somewhere and the only way to get it out sometime is just to grieve. And so when something happens like this, we can find ways to hope. We can find positives. But we still need to grieve. We still need to express our sorrow. And sometimes when we're expressing sorrow, words come out that we don't really want to come out, and later on we'll think back on some of those words, man, I wish I hadn't said that, but, but you know what it's like when you're hurting. I had a dog when I was a kid. I loved that dog, and she loved me. Her name was Crystal. We went everywhere together. We did everything together, but she bit me once. You know why she bit me? She was hurting. She'd been injured. She was in pain. And so when I approached her to try to do something about it, she bit me. Is, has that ever happened to anybody else? A beloved pet bites you because they're in pain? It, it happens sometimes. And I don't know if you can see a look on a dog's face 
But as soon as she bit me, I could tell she was sorry. She didn't mean to do that. When something like this happens, it calls for a lot of soul searching. Because our emotions are stirred. Anybody angry? Anybody incensed? You want to do something. And sometimes it seems like hate. I'll just hate. That'll expend a lot of energy. I get rid of some of this energy that I've got built up, some of this frustration. Uh, but hate only takes you so far. And it never really takes you in a right direction. We talk about righteous indignation, and there's a good place for righteous indignation. There's a lot of things that ought to make us angry, amen? Sometimes you can tell a person's character by the things that make them angry. We ought to be angry about this. We ought to be upset. But we should never give up hope. If you look at Ecclesiastes, there's a passage here I want to call our attention to in chapter 9. It's one verse. It's the last verse in chapter 9 of Ecclesiastes where Solomon says this. And remember who Solomon was. Solomon was the man. God said, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. Solomon said, I want wisdom. And God said, you haven't asked for riches or I would have given you that. You haven't asked for power over your enemies or I would have given you that. But you asked for wisdom and so I'm going to give you that. I'm also going to give you the riches and I'm going to give you power over your enemies. When we think like God thinks, he rewards that. So Solomon was given wisdom from God above every other man. No other man that has lived save Jesus Christ alone has been wiser than Solomon. And Solomon in his wisdom said this, in Ecclesiastes 9.18, he said, Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. How many shooters were there in Connecticut? There was one. How old was he? 20 years old. I remember being 20. I didn't know anything when I was 20. Somebody said this young man had some emotional problems, some mental problems. Well, you got to. You, you can't kill people without having mental and emotional problems the way he killed people. We need to pray for his family. I hope you'll amen that. And probably you already have been. I can't imagine being related to someone who would do something like that. And the way people would look at you with the stigma now. Evil reaches out in all kinds of directions. And what Solomon says here is that wisdom is better than weapons of war. Seek wisdom because it has a power that goes beyond the weapons of war. It has a power that transcends even events like this. But even while you're seeking wisdom and you're doing good with the wisdom you have from God, one sinner, one sinner can destroy much good. Let's back up and look at this in its context. Back up to chapter 9 and verse 10. This is what Solomon says puts this in its context, I think. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there's no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. Some of your translations say Sheol. Some may say Hades, but it means the grave. Again, I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift and the battle is not to the warriors and neither is bread to the wise nor wealth to the discerning nor favor to men of ability for time and chance Overtake them all. Moreover, a man does not know his time. Like fish caught in a treacherous net and birds trapped in a snare, so the sons of men are ensnared at an evil time when it suddenly falls on them. Also this I came to see as wisdom under the sun, and it impressed me. There was a small city with a few men in it, and a great king came to, came to it, surrounded it, constructed large siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he delivered the city by his wisdom. Yet no one remembered the poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength. But the wisdom of the poor man is despised, and his words are not heeded. The words of the wise heard in quietness are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. What's Solomon say? 
The last thing he says is one sinner can destroy much good, but what does he say before that? He says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. What do you do from day to day? Are you a student at school? Be a student with all your might. Are you a mom? Be a mom with all your might. Do you work at a construction site? Work at that construction site with all your might. Do you pass out funds and take in deposits at a bank? Do that with all your might. Whatever you do from day to day, do it with all your might. Because that's what God has given you to do. That's what the balance of Ecclesiastes will teach us. And when it comes time to celebrate some great event, celebrate that event. Don't hold back. Don't feel guilty because you have prosperity and you're able to celebrate. Celebrate that. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. Because one of these days you're going to die. That's what he says. So live your life in such a way to express your faith in God that all is not lost. There might be depression in this world and in this life and in your life, but your life is not about depression. Our lives need to be about God. Yes, one sinner can destroy much good, but wisdom is more powerful than all the weapons of war. You put those things together and you think about this poor man. Wouldn't you like to know, I would like to know, how did that poor man in his wisdom deliver the city from that king who had besieged it? Doesn't say. I'd like to know that, but it doesn't say how he did it. But it does say this, that even though that poor man's wisdom delivered the city, he was forgotten. If you and I could talk to America, if they would say, here's a microphone, speak to the nation, and tell us how to end our woes, what would you tell them? What would your wisdom be? If we were to say, it's Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Do you think they'd listen to you? I get the idea. That's what Solomon's talking about. There's a poor man, and his wisdom was powerful. His wisdom was more powerful than the weapons of war. His wisdom was so powerful that it delivered a city besieged by a king. But what happened to the poor man? What happened to his wisdom? It was forgotten. It was forgotten. I'd like to say that Jesus has not been forgotten. And I think to a great extent he has not. It impressed me, and I, I don't usually read quotes from other people. I, if I'm going to quote, I like to quote the scriptures. But, but here's a quote that I think bears repeating, and maybe some of you have seen this. It's from Mr. Rogers. You, mem you remember Mr. Rogers had the TV show for kids? Won't you be my neighbor? Good show. He's dead and gone now, but, but this is something that he said. So when I was a boy, I would see scary things in the news. My mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. To this day, especially in times of disaster, I remember my mother's words. I remember my mother's words, and I'm always comforted by realizing that there are still so many helpers, so many caring people in this world. Is that not still true? It's still true. You care. You look on TV, and there's people that care. People showed up in, in just scads to do something. Their hearts were broken over what happened. They, they turned out because they, there's still the influence of God in this world. There's still the influence of God in people's hearts. There's still enough influence for God that if we keep preaching the gospel... People are going to listen eventually. It may be that in some situations it's events like this that will turn people back to the idea we need to listen to more of this poor man's wisdom, so to speak. And so we need to be preaching. Somebody says, what should we do as the church when something like this happens? The same thing the church is always supposed to be doing. Nothing different, nothing new, nothing... What's the word I'm looking for? Uh... Well, the same thing that the church is always supposed to have been done. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Serve those who need to be served. It's, it's like the scene on judgment when God gathers the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. What does he say to the sheep? I was hungry, and what would you do? You fed me. How profound is that? Well, that's pretty simple, isn't it? I was thirsty, and what would you do? You gave me something to drink. I was in prison. You came and visited me. I was naked and you clothed me. Those are the things that Jesus is telling us 
God is most concerned with. And by doing these kinds of things, we let our light shine. Do these kinds of things. Pray. Pray for your own family and then do something to better your own family's situation, especially on a spiritual level. Pray for those people who've suffered loss in Oregon and those people who've suffered loss in Connecticut. Pray for the families who've been identifying their little ones and who are planning funerals as we speak. Pray for the family of the shooter. Pray. Pray to God that he would help us as individuals to do what we need to do. Things are not so bad that we can't still be an influence in this world. Amen? And it doesn't matter who you are or where you are. You have a power where you are and with the people you run in circles with that you can influence them. People I would never perhaps come in contact with, you have a power to influence. You can stand up with faith and courageously tell them, Jesus really is the answer. You're looking for answers to this? Well, there's no answers for some things that happen in this life. But for the pain, for the anguish, Jesus really is the answer. When you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul starts this letter to the church at Corinth. And, and I don't know if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians, but if you read through 1 Corinthians, what you're going to find is a church that is fraught with problems, with trouble. There's division. There's, there's fleshly-minded people in the church at Corinth. I know we don't have any of those here, but they had them in Corinth. And there were people who were even suing each other over financial situations. They had a guy who was living with his father's wife. They had so many messed up situations in Corinth that even the Lord's Supper was messed up. Paul said, I, you come together for the Lord's Supper? Well, I don't commend you for that because you're not coming together for the Lord's Supper. This is what you do. You don't even care about each other. Somebody comes in and they didn't have a nice communion set like we've got, I'm sure. The, the rich folks came in and they had their stuff for the Lord's Supper. They went ahead and ate theirs and they didn't wait on the poor folks who came in who didn't have any. There wasn't any concern for each other. That's the kind of congregation that was there. And so Paul wrote this letter and he, he tried to straighten those things out. So when he starts 2 Corinthians, after having written that scathing rebuke in the first letter, this is what he says. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 starting at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. What things did Christ suffer? Of course, the imagery comes to mind of the cross itself and of the beating. But don't you think Christ's suffering started long before the cross? I mean, just in those last three years he hung out with the apostles. How many things did he have to deal with? Just with those guys. And those were the best he could find, I'm sure. And yet it was problem after problem after problem and dumb question over dumb question and dumb issues. Some people say there aren't any dumb questions. Well, hey, I've heard a few myself. I don't know about you. When you're arguing over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, that's kind of a dumb thing to argue over. And they knew it. They were ashamed and embarrassed to tell him, oh, we were arguing over who's going to be the greatest. Jesus was born into this world. He came willingly, knowing that it's a mess. The government was the one who went to Bethlehem and killed all the children two years old and under. Aren't you thankful we don't live in a country where the government can do that? Oh, wait a minute. The government does that, don't they? The world's messed up. I ain't staying here forever. How about you? I'm planning on leaving. And when I go, I want to take as many people with me as, as I can. Now, that sounds horrible to say it like that. <laughs> but if you're thinking in a godly perspective, that's exactly what I want to say. I want everybody to know that's true. I want to go to heaven, and I want everybody to go to heaven with me. I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the comfort that he provides. I'm not ashamed of the fact that even though something like this happens and, and my heart breaks and we shed tears over it and we're, we're frustrated because we don't know what to do or what to say, I, I take great comfort in knowing I can go to Jesus Christ and I can talk to him about it. And I have comfort. I have peace. Even while we cry about things, we have peace because we know that he's the one who's going to make things right. This is life. 
This is life. These things that we read in the news, these things that we see on our TVs, these things that we suffer in our own lives. None of us are going to get out of it alive, except, except for those who get out of it to live forever. I want to be one of those. I want you to be one of those. And I have to wonder now, will we meet some children when we get there? Some little ones who lived in Connecticut, who don't live on this planet anymore. How do you make sense of it? Jesus. Jesus. I want to close with the words of the song we just sang a little while ago. Thank you for singing that song, Bobby. It's 943. Do you know my Jesus? Do you know my Jesus? If you had that microphone, that one you could use to talk to the country, to the world, maybe this would be a good thing to say. 943, do you know my Jesus? Have you a heart that's weary, tending a load of care? Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burden you bear? Do you know my Jesus? Do you know my friend? Have you heard he loves you and that he will abide till the end? And then there's a second verse. Now, we didn't sing this. Where is your heart, O pilgrim? What's a pilgrim? That's somebody who's not home. He's just passing through. We're just passing through, are we not? Where's your heart, O pilgrim? What does your light reveal? Who hears your call for comfort when naught but sorrow you feel? Who knows your disappointments? Who hears each time you cry? Who understands your heartaches? Who dries the tears from your eyes? Do you know my Jesus? Do you know my friend? Have you heard he loves you? And then he will abide to the end. We're going to stand and sing a song. Not this song, but another song. But that same song we're going to sing is going to call you to respond if you don't know Jesus, if he's not yet your friend, if you've not yet been baptized into him, or if you have and you need the prayers of this congregation for anything to deal with whatever, we're here for you because Jesus is here for you. Let's stand and sing. More of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving